uh, white whiskey on it. And then we'll like pour it in as water. Okay. All right. We are we're live, so um, I'll give it a second for people to jump on. That way, we don't, you know, people like intros and everything else. So, um, but uh, uh, <laughs> somebody's already got Wi-Fi jokes for me in the uh, comments. Uh, can y'all see all the comments as well? So we have the private comments on our side, uh, and then yeah, for those unfamiliar with Streamyard. Um, all right, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and kick it off and then we'll go through intros and yeah, we'll be all set. So welcome everyone. I'm Blake from Bourboner. This is the first barrel pick from Chattanooga Whiskey. Uh, today we're joined by several different faces you probably recognize, but um, yeah, we're going to be picking the first barrel to ever come out of Chattanooga Whiskey. Um, assuming you are familiar with familiar with Chattanooga whiskey. We'll go ahead and kind of go through their different products and what makes these single barrels special. But uh, to get started, we'll go ahead and introduce everyone. So the first person on my screen is John, John from Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Go ahead and uh, tell everyone where you're from and where they can find you. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, or I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, unlike whatever Tim has, has put on Chattanooga Whiskey on the page today. It is dad apostrophe S is incorrect. You guys did it again. <laughs> that was that not means, That means there's two dads. Is plural, is no apostrophe. It's apostrophe not possessive. Apostrophe means possessive. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are the Dad's Rick and Bourbon. We are a podcast out of Nashville, Tennessee. And we just, you know, I, I've been following Chattanooga for a long time from their 1816 to all the other cool things they've done, like the native barrel finish and their 91-111. And Blake, I think, you know, thank you for having me here. I think you and I were both on record of saying it was one of the best trans transitions from MGP to their own distillate that we've ever seen. I think we had similar sentiments with that. So mm -hmm. I'm just super excited to be here today and, and be a part of this with all of you. And I know you guys thought my name might have been Kenny at first, but thank you. I ate him. <laughs> And I know I'm kind of uh, crashing the party that normally would have the Bourbon Pursuit podcast in here, but I'm sure Kenny and I will text later and everything will be okay. No no bad blood. That's good to hear. So, oh, Kenny, Kenny right. and I go way back. We both went to UK together. So. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. That's fair enough. So uh, Nick from Breaking Bourbon, you are sure. up. Yeah, thanks, Blake. So I'm Nick. I'm one of the three co-founders of Breaking Bourbon. Uh, very excited to be here on this pick. I think like the first, the first of anything like that is really exciting. Um, I didn't try any of these samples yet, so I'm super pumped to uh, to try them now. And I, I gotta believe that we've got like three of the absolute best, you know, barrels that are that are there. But you know, certainly from the Chattanooga that that I've had so far, it fantastic product. You know, definitely, you know, excited to see how that progresses over time. It's it's absolutely great, but. Um, you know, check us out on uh, breakingbourbon.com, uh, all the socials, all that good stuff. So I'll go ahead and uh, let uh, one of my other two counterparts uh, jump in next. Yeah. Hey, this is Jordan from Breaking Bourbon. Like Nick said, make sure to check out the website. You know, latest releases are almost near daily update or release calendar. Uh, make sure you sign up to tune in and, and check out all the good stuff. Thanks for having us. We're super excited to be here today. Thanks. And Jay. All you, hey. my friend. Hey, go yeah, ahead. Welcome. You guys. I am. Uh, I'm Jay. I also go by Take, which you guys probably know me from from the internet. Um, I run Take Review. I'm also a moderator for our Bourbon, which is probably where you guys have seen more of me. Um, but I release reviews or several every day on the internet. Uh, Instagram, Take Dot Review, um, pretty much any kind of spirit except Baiju because Baiju's gross. So uh, <laughs> if you're looking for. <laughs> Brandy, Whiskey, <laughs> Armaniac, Mezcal, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, that's that's what I like to talk about. But I'm super pumped to be here. Thanks for having me. I've, I've been hearing a lot about Chattanooga, but it's not not up here in Wisconsin yet. So this is my first taste of anything chat, which is super cool. Very cool. And uh, yeah, if if you didn't know already, so uh, we have Tim and Grant also here as well. Tim's the founder of Chattanooga Whiskey and Grant's the master distiller. So guys, if you want to introduce yourself and I mean, we can get right down to it. If you want to start talking about the whiskey and kind of what we're going to be tasting, we'll be pouring and get this thing started. Yeah, I appreciate that, Blake. Yeah, so uh, I'm Tim. This is Grant over here. And uh, this is as close as we've been to each other in a very long time. So um, yeah. <laughs> 
So we're at six feet, our heads yes. are just huge. Yes, it's true. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so um, first of all, it's awesome to be hanging out with you guys. Um, we have much respect for uh, all of your uh, influences and passion in what we do and make, and um, and we're excited to you know be able to share a first time experience with you guys, and that is the release of our first single barrel uh, out of our Riverfront Distillery, which is, uh, again, um, the first single barrel of our Barrel 91 recipe, uh, which make up Chattery Whiskey 91 and Chattery Whiskey 111. So um, I'll, I'll kind of provide some background on history. If you guys uh, have any questions or want to stop me for any reason, feel free. Trust me, I could, I could talk for hours without stopping. <clears throat> so um, one one thing that um, I'd like to encourage, if anybody has their their browsers open, or uh, you know can open another window, is uh, definitely go to ChattanoogaWhiskey.com. There's a lot of really good information on there. Um, I would uh, I'd go uh, as I touch on history. You might want to go to ChattanoogaWhiskey.com backslash history, and uh, and there's you'll see a timeline. And you'll notice that, you know, right off the bat, you should notice that a lot has happened with Chattanooga whiskey in a pretty short period of time, relatively speaking, because Chattanooga whiskey wasn't founded, you know, in the uh, 1800s or early 1900s. Chattanooga whiskey was founded in 2011, um, but it was inspired by what happened pre-prohibition in this town. So... Um, to kind of start there, basically from, uh, from 1866 to 1915, Chattanooga had a really rich distilling history, and we wanted to bring that back. Uh, that was the inspiration for, uh, for establishing Chattanooga whiskey. And we called it Chattanooga whiskey to really uh, to represent all that was great in bourbon pre-prohibition. So um, when we started... It was illegal to distill in Chattanooga. Chattanooga was, um, we're only one of 95 counties in Tennessee. Uh, actually, the, the vast majority of the state couldn't. Only a, only a few counties uh, could distill. And in 2009, there was a bill that went through that uh, was kind of the beginning of the craft distilling movement in uh, Tennessee. And that opened up a handful of other counties, but uh, Chattanooga was excluded, and so were many other uh, prominent, uh, you know, counties and counties. People just wanted to uh, to build their distilleries and begin their you know, b begin their uh, whiskey craft. Uh, were left out of that. So when we started, we had the source, and um, there were not many. Uh, there were actually not many whiskey distilleries that were doing 30 third party manufacturing back in 2011. Uh, but of the few that were, we were fortunate to have Lawrenceburg Distillers or MGP. Um, when we got our samples in, we really loved the MGP bourbon samples that we received. This was in 2011, 2012. Um, so we were really excited about it. We felt like this was the best product to start our mission on. And so uh, we selected what was a 75% corn, 21% rye, 4% malted barley product. And we called it 1816. Uh, many are, here's actually the 1816 label here. Um, so uh, of those who've been following us are probably familiar with the 1816 product. That's how we got our start. And then uh, simultaneously, we started raising awareness to change these laws. So we started a campaign called the Vote Whiskey Campaign. Um, the Vote Whiskey Campaign uh, was to raise awareness, to galvanize public support, and ultimately to get the laws changed in Chattanooga. But because it was a, uh, it was not just a county, uh, it was not just a county law. It was actually a state law. We ended up having to form new bills and rewriting laws for the for the state of Tennessee and distilling in the state of Tennessee. But the way those laws were written, they allowed for essentially the rest of the state to open up. So uh, it took us nearly two years to fight that. 
Uh, we were successful in spring of 2013. Those laws changed. Um, they changed for the rest of the t state of Tennessee. Uh, and Chattanooga Whiskey is proud to have spearheaded through the Vote Whiskey campaign, spearheaded what is a, what, what was a really um, or helped spearhead was a massive craft movement in Tennessee. Again, Tennessee going from just a few distilleries to now more than 30 distilleries. We have a Tennessee Distillers Guild. We have uh, the Tennessee Whiskey Trail. So um, we're very, uh, we're very proud to have been a big part of that. But when those laws changed, again, it took us nearly two years to change those laws. Um, it really became about who we were going to be when we grew up. And uh, well, it took us an additional two years to build what became the first distillery in Chattanooga in 100 years. That is the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery. Um, I didn't know that when we were going, when we when we finally built a distillery, that it was going to be an experimental whiskey distillery. <clears throat> uh, we just wanted to make it great. We just wanted to get our feet planted and begin making our own product. And and I really wanted to figure out this transition from what was LDI or MGP to what was our own product. When Grant came into the picture um, in 2014, uh, at the beginning of constructing the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery, Grant and I's philosophies married up uh, right off of the bat because um, of us coming out of the Vote Whiskey campaign and changing laws, kind of being rule changers, but honoring the tradition of great whiskey from Tennessee and great bourbon. Grant had that same mission, and he also wanted to change the rules, but he wanted to continue that through into whiskey. And that's, what I, that's, that's really where the effort began to, okay, we both agreed that we wanted to make a great bourbon whiskey. That was at the foundation of what, it, what we wanted to do. We didn't want to just trash 1816. It's a good bourbon. MGP makes a great bourbon. There was no reason to trash it. There was no reason to alienate our customer base and just make a hard right hand turn. So how could we honor that and develop something that was truly our own, that we could call our own, that we were proud to make from Tennessee and, and, and that was richer and more complex. That's what we were after. So Grant's background, I'm going to let Grant speak for himself, but Grant's background, the beauty of it was that he was the head brewer for a prominent brewery. I would consider Grant one of the best brewers, you know, in the country or the world. And he, and he really, what he, what he is really masterful at is working with grains and working with yeast and fermentation and uh, particularly malted grains. So instantly Grant's like, Hey, if we're ever going to build a bigger distillery, because this, our experimental distillery, it's our tourist attraction, but it's a small location. It's about 3,000 square feet. It's a 100-gallon pot still. If we're ever going to scale any of these recipes up into a larger location, let's explore the world of malted grains and long cold, you know, utilizing long cold fermentations, utilizing dozens of different types of yeasts and how that impacts specifically bourbon whiskey. And that was the beauty of the experimental distillery. So from day one, from in, when we established in March of 2015, exactly 100 years after the last distillery shut down in Chattanooga, Tennessee, we instantly started exploring the world of malts, different yeasts, long cold fermentations, and even different barrel finishes, toasts and chars, in the in within bourbon whiskey so two years down the road of doing this we developed over a hundred different barrel a hundred different rest i mean uh over more than a hundred different barrels and dozens and dozens of different experimental recipes as we built our headquarters which is the chattanooga whiskey riverfront distillery which is a mile away from the experimental distillery right before we opened up we said, all right, we're going to scale one of these recipes up to become our flagship. And our whole, and our team got together and we narrowed it down from, I think, nearly 120 experimental high malt bourbons 
down to 60, 40, 20, and then got down to four. And Grant and I sat in a room and we said, all right, what is going to do 1816, our fan base, our history, the best justice, but also is this richer, deeper flavor profile we're going after? That is barrel number 91. So it was actually the 91st barrel distilled and barreled at the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery. Now, mind you, throughout this process, because we everything we were doing was high malt, we wanted, we did not charcoal filter. It was not a traditional Tennessee whiskey. Uh, it was, it's obviously not a Kentucky straight bourbon, but it is a straight bourbon whiskey, and it is uniquely high malt, and it has many other unique characteristics about it. So we coined and trademarked Tennessee high malt. So Tennessee high malt was born out of the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery. It was born out of the first two years of experimenting. And when we scaled up barrel number 91 to become the recipe for Chattanooga Whiskey 91 and Chattanooga Whiskey 111, and we launched, we, we distilled those for an additional two plus years at Riverfront. When we launched those, we launched it with our campaign that Chattanooga Whiskey is the only Tennessee High malt. So there are some specific things that make that up. But before I go too deep into that, um, I want to give Grant an opportunity to jump in here and talk about that. Pro you know, any any part of history or about that development process that I might have missed. Um, and if you guys have any uh, questions, uh, feel free to ask. Before I guess before Grant jumps in, do you guys have any questions? I have one. All right, go for it, John. Has the Catalina wine mixer been moved? this year or is it still on track i mean is it okay we're we're we're, we're planning it it's, it's fortunately we have time so no there were a lot of people that were in the dad drinking bourbon group that were really wanting to know that so i can't take credit for it i, I stole it from someone <laughs> i have one question before it goes to grant a serious question all right so as you guys were were thinking about the 91 and, and the 111 and the profile you had here is the profile you would say of the single barrels where do you think that finds itself leaning more that's a great question um <clears throat> um I, I feel like we'll we'll get into a little bit more of that i guess long to make a short answer and then eventually go into a longer answer of it um th it's does this single barrel tasting is really designed to peel apart the layers of tennessee high malt so um, the three samples that are in front of you are really uh, three, I would say two major layers and then one wild card. Um, so to, to pinpoint any particular, this is what makes Tennessee high malt um, would be really tough there. Uh, if you're talking, I would say samples, probably A and, uh, A and C focus on the spirit a little bit more. So the high malt spirit. And then sample B probably focuses more on the synergy of the barrel and the similar characteristics that we get from the spirit, but we're actually getting them out of the barrel. And, you know, that's one thing that, you know, from a, from a recipe development perspective that we were big on from the beginning is the idea of synergy. And um, I think, uh, you know, when, when we decided to, when we started to think of this Tennessee high malt thing as something that was ours, um, we realized that, yeah, high malt is our type of bourbon and it expresses itself in a rich forward way, but every part of the process, we want to enhance that. So in fermentation, in the distilling cuts and in the barrel aging uh, and in the finishing process eventually uh, for, for 91, all of those steps are meant to highlight and bring out that malt character even more. So it's really kind of a, you know, an homage to, to malt. Um, and that's why, you know, Tennessee high malt is Tennessee high malt. It's not talking about necessarily the, the longer, cooler fermentations or what, uh, where we uh, cut and distill at or particular uh, specifics about the barrels. It's Tennessee high malt first and foremost. Um, that's a very long, long-winded answer to a question, but it does kind of uh, segue into 
malt as an ingredient. And I, I think Tim, you know, he's hit on a lot of the major points that um, I, could, I couldn't really explain it any better. Um, the one thing I'll go into in, on malt specifically, um, especially considering that the bourbon industry, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, if you saw my, my bourbon collection, you'd probably call me pathetic or something. I've, since we started the, the, the distillery, my blinders personally have been on for the most part to try to just figure out what we wanted to make. Um, so early when I, before I joined the company, I had a small bourbon collection and, and was a fan, but I came from the craft brewing industry. So it was kind of like a, you know, just a, a fascination at a certain point. Um, I joined Chattanooga Whiskey uh, in late 2014. Um, and, uh, you know, I had gotten a cert certificate in, in uh, a small education in distilling. But, you know, uh, one thing that Tim and his team recognized um, was that great whiskey does in some ways come from great beer, that all of the ingredients are there. It's basically taking one extra step and kind of flipping some rules upside down. But from there, you know, the, the core mantra, the core kind of principles are the same. Um, and, uh, you know, from a, from a perspective of, of influences or whatever, we, we didn't have many. So it, my, my influences were for coming from my time in, in craft brewing. So, you know, fermentation process and malted ingredients were very important to me. Um, but it, when I looked at traditional bourbon, I saw in mash bills that said the word malt in them. And that's all they said. And I wasn't really familiar with that. Uh, you know, from, from my uh, past malt, if you just talked about it generically, you were talking about your base malt. Everything else was usually the specialty malt that really grabbed people's attention and made a style a style. So when most of the bourbon industry talks about malt, it's not a negative way, but uh, it's kind of a commodity in a certain respect. And that's because traditional bourbon, the barrel is king. You're, you know, the, the spirit is a, a, a canvas, albeit a flavorful one, to let the barrel speak through. But traditional bourbon is typically a little bit more barrel forward than spirit forward compared to, let's say, something like scotch. And for us, when we talk about malt, we're specifically talking more about specialty malts. Um, and those come from, you know, hundreds of different varieties from dozens, if not hundreds of maltsters worldwide. And, you know, we, when we started experimenting for these two years from 2015 to 2017, we realized that that was really a place where we could express ourselves the most, the most and come up with a, a flavor profile that spoke to us. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, as Tim said, through those first hundred barrels, we really tried everything. Um, a lot of different malts, over a hundred, hundreds of malts, probably almost. Um, and uh, along with that, dozens of different types of yeasts, dozens of type, types of barrels. But it was all kind of focused on how do we let this malt character really speak through and that richness speak through. Um, so, um, you know, from a malting process perspective, uh, you know, most base malts are lightly kilned, so they're kind of toasted to a certain degree, but a lot of our specialty malts that we work with, they can be anything from lightly toasted to lightly caramelized, to heavily roasted, to smoked, to uh, stewed and then roasted. I mean, the, the combinations are endless and they make vastly different products. And what you guys see in your, in your kit is the four grains and the three malts that are in our our 91 recipe. Um, and those yeah. you, you will find that are they're pretty wildly different. Even the two malted barleys are pretty different. And that's just the malted And I'd but, say with that, let, let's go ahead and jump into the first sample. Um, so, uh, and I guess if with sample A, you know, are we talking about the same mash bills with yep. in the same malts in all three different samples? Yeah. Um, it's a great. Okay. Sample. The, so the three samples yep. in front of you, the one thing about that makes this particular recipe 91 um, a little more special than, you know, most uh, uh, gen general recipes in the bourbon industry is we use a combination of charred, classically charred barrels and toasted and charred barrels. So what you have in front of you are three samples. Um, 
two of them, the number four char, which is sample C, and uh, the number three char with a toast profile, which is sample B, those you could you could really uh, identify as uh, the foundation of what makes 91 and 111, 91 and 111. Mm -hmm. You take one uh, four barrels of a uh, barrel-like number, or sorry, letter C, and bring it together with four barrels of the toasted and charred uh, sample B, and you'll end up with the Tennessee high malt profile. So when we when we decided to do a single barrel program, we thought, how are we going to do this? There, you know, we have different barrel profiles, and this is how we did it. We we decided to highlight the the differences in each one of these samples. Let you guys peel apart the components of Tennessee high malt and really showcase what they are. And so, John, back to your your initial question which one really exemplifies Tennessee high malt B and C together do because they are the principal components of Tennessee high malt. We, we also every once in a while throw some wild cards into barrels for these single barrels to really showcase what the spirit does in different barrel profiles, uh, whether they be different chars or chars and toasts. Interesting. Yeah. yeah with that, let's jump into sample A. So um, Jay, what do you think so far on sample A? So I'm <clears throat> sorry, little frog there. So this is only two years and eleven months, which actually kind of shocks me. There's a there's quite a bit of oak on the nose, which I really enjoy. Um, I think that's going well. There's a little bit of fruits, a little bit of caramel. Uh, you know, this isn't the maltiest, but it's certainly you know there's it's definitely clear that you guys are going for that malty bready profile, um, which I, I really like. Um, yeah, a lot of apple yeah. pie, a lot of berry, some currant. Which is Here's nice. the, uh, anybody can see that? Oh, yeah. I suppose like that could be useful and, and pop that up there, too. Um, yeah, yeah I, I put the – um. Or I don't know if they went to all the chats, but it's on the YouTube chat. <laughs> I put the uh, the breakdown. But for sample A, it was barreled on uh, 517.17. And it's char number two. It's 117.18 proof. Um, John, what did you think of sample A so far? The answer is Texas. Um, <laughs> but um honestly and and i mean no disrespect by the by this this one was a little bit hot for me and just kind of looking at what we have here with the ingredients you know i i think that this was a char two and the other ones were char three and four there was no toast on this i think this is where you really get the most profile of the distillate without any help from the barrel and and knowing that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you guys put into your distillation process your fermentation process and that the beer is better going into the barrel i still think there the barrel needs to work a little bit to take that edge off a little bit and i think the toast and char of two and the char of four kind of take that little bit of the red hot off of it but, you know, if you like Red Hots, one's your jam. It just was not, you know, I like two and three a little bit more. Yeah, I kind of, I had a different uh, a different thought on that. I, I liked it. I was getting a little more berries and some fruit notes and definitely got some oak um, with, with spice and a little bit of black pepper. But I don't know. I, I kind of enjoyed that part of it. Um, but, you know, it sounds like we're going to have we're setting up for a big showdown at the end with the uh, the voting and everything. So Nick it's and Jordan, really rich on the palate. It's, it's a good thing we've got uh, five people, right? Yeah, we're exactly. Be able to yeah. uh, have a majority. We had, maybe we have an odd number for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Lessons Flipping. learned. Yeah. I just drew a line in the sand to get it going. Right. Yeah, from the start. you gotta you be go. divisive. You got <laughs> Blake is so. just playing devil's advocate anyway. Trust me, he's gonna yeah, vote yeah, for something completely it's... different. <laughs> no, but I, I got that big pop of spice on uh, sample A too. Um, I am getting the other, you know, some of these other flavors are following some of that maltiness, some of the nuttiness um, after that pop of spice. But that is, it is pretty overwhelming at first. Um, so if you're going for that kind of that, you know, kind of heat that spice right up front you know this one definitely brings that to the table um i'd say too the nose was fairly expressive to me um i won't start talking about the other two just yet but it's definitely you know as far as the th three samples go it's one of the more expressive noses of the three um so that's where i'm at what do you think jordan 
So I, uh, I quickly just went through and tried all three samples. And I think, you know, the three A is probably my, my least preferable. I think we have some really great barrels here to choose from. I think A shows a little bit more of the youth versus I think the deeper char of B and C really helps mask it a little bit, right? The creaminess I found in B and C, I don't see as much in A. I see more of that pop that everyone else was talking about. Um, it's good. I'm really excited to talk about B and C because I think those are more of my jam. Um, but I think it's going to be a little bit more personal preference, but all really good barrels to, to choose from. I think those folks who don't normally have access to Chattanooga or who haven't had a Tennessee, you know, malt or geez, who just aren't used to drinking American malt whiskey in general, um, they're going to be super surprised and super excited. And I'm excited to introduce them to a whole new category, right? Which is, which is really interesting and really exciting. Well, I thought we had some good palates on the uh, tasting today. Apparently not. If we... <laughs> hey, well, you, can, you can excuse yourself. <laughs> okay. I won't, you it know, sounds to me like my final, my final sales pitch at the end. <laughs> it sounds to me like Jordan and I are taking a barrel no matter what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Blake could take A on his own. <laughs> yeah, get A. But, uh... All right. With, so with that, let's move on to barrel, uh, barrel B. Um, and I put this up in the chat, but this is a char number three. Uh, it does have a toast profile, which is P37. So we'll we'll let Tim explain that in, in just a second. It's 118 proof, and it was also distilled on uh, May 17th, 2017. So Tim, quick question for you. Uh, one, what does toast pro profile P37 mean? And two, would these have come from the same dis distillate and into a different barrel, uh, A and B? Or um, you know, what are we looking at there? Well, well, I can definitely answer that We're question. Coming, yes. Tim and Grant, I guess. Yeah, may, that may be a Grant question. And I will. So I'm going to let the uh, the chief product officer take over here. So um, to answer your question, the the same. This is the same recipe. It it's not necessarily going to be the exact same uh, distillation run. Um, unless I'm wrong here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. No. It actually was the same run on this one, 1709. Yeah, so the, the same distillation run for A and B, um, so just different barrel. And the Profile 37, um, if you guys, uh, you might, I think we included a sales sheet in the, um, in the single barrel kit, and that does explain some of the flavors created from the toasting process. And 37, if you look at the chart, that uh we included there it's kind of a it's kind of right in the dead center it's got kind of a a moderate amount of time being toasted and the temperature of the toasting is on the medium to medium high range and it's about approximately let's say 30 to 35 minutes long so if you compare that toasting to a charring process charring is usually a minute or under and uh, that toasting process is really building a lot of deep extractives uh, deep within the staves of the barrel. You get a lot of hemicellulose breakdown. You get a little a lot of uh, lignin destruction, and like a lot of a lot of development of extractives in the toasting process. And what 37 particularly does, um, I think, so all of these barrels are made by ISC, and they call that profile specifically the uh, balanced oak profile. Um, and, uh, it just, it builds a, a balance between usually about a sweet and spicy character and then an underlying kind of toastiness, sweetness underneath there. So like kind of baking, baking big goods character underneath it. Which so I've got a question. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Blake. No, I was just going to say, it's so interesting to see that they were from the same distillate, but I get pretty different profiles. Very I mean, different. From, from B, I get... Man, I always get like a charred marshmallow note. Uh, it, it is yeah. slightly more tannic, but it's like a it's more like a graham cracker sweetness with some of that baking spice on the back end. Mm -hmm. But it's not like hit you in your. It's not like fruity and sweet as I felt the first one was. So that's probably more of the the distillate coming through on sample A. Whereas this one, you know, you're bringing in all the the notes from the barrel. Um, but yeah, what were you going to say, Nick? Well, I was going to ask because I, I had looked at our reviews for uh, the 91 and the 111 earlier, and I was looking at that, you know, Solera finished or that kind of like that finishing for the 91. And then the 111 cask, um, 
the fermentation extended seven days. What are we looking at here for these? Are these that extended fermentation? I are they, you know, doing that single that Solera and then going somewhere? What what's that kind of process as to how that relates to those two standard products, the ninety one and the one eleven? So so all of our fermentations distillery wide all uh, have a seven day extended fermentation. We uh, drop the temperature a little bit to the upper 70s and that subdues ester formation a little bit and also highlights the malt character. So across the board, all the recipes are gonna be right around the same fermentation time. For 91, we actually, uh, none of these are Solera finished. Uh, 91, um, that particular recipe takes of age, fully mature uh, 91 rest, fully mature barrels and marries them together in a approximately 90, 91-ish barrel capacity Solera vat. Gotcha. And each time we bottle, we bottle off about 10 barrels and then top it back up. So the tank never goes empty. It adds a little bit more esterification because you get the porosity of air migration in through into the Solera barrel. And that gives a little bit more fruit character within the 91. But if you were to use the, the water and dial these down to the 90s, you will notice that fruit character, that ester profile really pop out a little bit more. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And I'm as we're kind of coming back to the samples here, I'm definitely, you know, talking about sample B a little bit. Um, it's definitely got less spice for me than A had. Um, it took a little while for the nose to open up on it. I felt like on the first pour, I wasn't getting much. But now as I keep coming back to it. It's, it's really starting to pull out some deeper flavors. Um, I'm finding it has a rich flavor profile to it. I'm getting it. It's more rounded without that spice. I'm getting, you know, some of these malty chocolate notes. I'm getting a little more fruit on it, some nuttiness um, with that one. Uh, definitely to the color. It's, it's a pretty dark color um, that I'm noticing a little bit in comparison to the other two as a little bit of a darker one. So I'm definitely digging sample B. And it too, it seems like the most different from the other two um, barrels so far um, as a comparison. It's definitely, you know, the, the one that is over here, whereas A and C are nuanced where their, where their differences are. So what surprised me was sample B, right? Especially compared to A, to me, this is like more richer, more dessert-like, right? So that you get more of the sweetness, you know, the baking spice we talked about, you get a little bit of cherry pie. The finish is pretty short, but it just makes you go back for more. And I keep, I had a look at the proof again, just to remind myself that this is only 120 proof, but it drinks incredibly easy. And um, to me, this just, I don't know, this is just a really sweet, delicious, easy sipping whiskey. Like this is just, you know, I can, I can go through this whole sample bottle during this tasting and, and ask for that's more. The, this is really good. That's a fancy way of saying it's smooth. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> no, I'm not, it's not, I'm not saying that. It's Alan, really, your it's, favorite it's, flavor note is... No, uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever used the word smooth, but it's it's rich and complex, but it really has a lot of those dessert notes that yeah. um, A no, just it, didn't have, which is, which is just interesting and unique and really stands out from the three to me. Yeah. John, you you uh you definitely said B and C were more up your alley. So what'd you think about B? If B doesn't win, I'm gonna pull a Kanye. Uh, <laughs> John. But I'm just pull saying, my name. Right, you would too. He's the best sample of all time. I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm gonna let you guys finish. And I was trying to let everybody go through. I was gonna let Tate go through, but honestly. B is everything is a fat guy that I love in the world. It's you know, it's it's candy bar, it's right dessert, right it's down. creamy, the mouthfeel around it. I'm not even gonna like I don't have to go through specifics. It's just like you take chocolate and nougat and peanuts and all this like all that stuff that just makes me feel good inside when I'm eating it, but Jordan that makes me feel terrible later. Yeah. <laughs> that is everything that I love about number two. Yeah, yeah I'm right, with Jay, no, that one. no pressure. Yeah, no pressure to uh, follow those, but we want to hear some some nougats. Some uh... <laughs> no, it, so so to me, it, it's kind of interesting. And you might have seen I switched glasses here. I, I did add some water because um, it's always interesting. You know, some people are very anti-water, and some people just want you to drown drown the thing. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a hundred uh, or a three musketeers bars. What I'm thinking, like between like 
hundred grand, three musketeers. It's like everything in in the vending machine that I get at like two a.m. You know, when I'm at that someplace. But you know, and it's got it's got a really strong mouthfeel, and I, I had to look at the proof as well because it, it drinks like you know I had to make sure you guys didn't throw like a ninety proof in here. You know, just to, to give us <laughs> drink again. But you know, this this is really rich, and I. You know, I think the barrel is adding a lot here. I, I did like A because it felt very spirity. Like, okay, you know, this is chat spirit. Um, but B is kind of tying the whole package together, especially with that toast. And I'm not typically a fan of things that feature any sort of toasting. You know, Michter's, you know, the toasted rye and the toasted bourbon just aren't for me. So, you know, I was a little doubtful. Um, and, and, you know, I kind of can't stop drinking it. And even with water, I, you know, I watered it down about half, so pretty low. Um, and it maintained a whole lot of, like, cocoa, nougat, rice crispy i was thinking of like waffle cone at the ice cream store you know mm -hmm. it's like totally dessert uh, i'm a fan i like I, it. I, actually I totally the, the, waffle, the waffle cone like fresh pressing waffle cones at an ice cream place that is a really good note that whatever you guys like, want to throw out more dessert stuff it's the, yeah, like, yeah. Whatever it is. Well, i mean this is dessert right here this is uh, i, 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 I guess we're done here well let's let's yeah. wrap it up no <laughs> with, with that let's go on to sample c um because i mean you know i'm not going to give up the fight that early I, i'll still play devil's advocate everywhere i can so it's okay well Jim, you got my like, number right <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah we'll go on to sample c so if you're uh listening we'll put um i believe it's already in the chats but i'll repost it uh here so sample c is barreled uh 426 17 um actually the day after my wedding anniversary so it would have been nice if we could hit the 25th but uh you know um yeah yeah <laughs> char number uh i'm sorry i typed that wrong it's actually char number four um and it's 118.81 proof um, so let me get that corrected amount in here really quick because it is not char number two, it's char number four, uh, 426, char number four. And, um, let's see the toast profile. There's no toast profile on this, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And by comparison, it's, it's just slightly older than the other two, but they're all mm -hmm. real tight within that three year range. Yeah, we're all we're all sitting on three years with pretty much all the samples. Yep. I have to hand it to you. None of these are like malty and gross. Like a lot of really young craft stuff. So you know, if you blinded me on these, I, I wouldn't know that they were three years old. Yeah. No. no, not and and I always expect a little. You know, with all the malts that go in, and you know, Grant, you'll probably talk about this better than I can, but. You know, I expect that very more like a beer nose, or you know, some of those malty. But I don't get that. Like, I get fruit, I get toasted, charred uh, marshmallows, and all that kind of stuff. So, is that the idea of blending? You know, the honey malts, the the caramel malts, the um, you know, all the different ones to get that profile where it's not a maltiness, but it's just adding fruit and sweetness and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Each each one of these malts has a very particular profile. The honey malt is very fruit forward. It's almost when you, you know, when you guys are done, you can uh, crunch down on some and you'll get a little bit of acidity in there. So it does bring a certain, um, you know, in the barrel that'll turn to more of a fruit character. Um, but it's interesting. Each of these malts, when, when they are kilned and toasted and roasted, they're actually creating very similar component chemically to what is created inside the barrel when there's when they are toasted and charred as well because the barrel as you guys know brings uh uh wood sugars and they're they're caramelized and toasted and the malt is bringing a uh, grain sugar that's toasted and charred and, and even though it's distilled off um during or after fermentation you still get those really volatile com compounds coming forward and giving you the essence of what was there to begin with. Um, so if you guys do even, if you go back and smell our white spirit and taste our white spirit in the kit, um, you'll, and then go and hit up our, our malts, you will get some of that maltiness and that toastiness and that roastiness there. And for us, for me personally, sometimes I don't know where, where the malt is coming in and where actually some of the barrel characters coming in. And that was actually by design. We wanted that synergy there. So we didn't know, we couldn't overtly call out, Oh, this is malt or, Oh, this is barrel, but together they kind of synergize. And that was yeah. the attempt. And 
which I think that really comes through. And, um, you, you know, the thing I love about craft distilling is it's showing off the grains and not, not being so heavily reliant on just the barrel. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, Kentucky, we all love Kentucky bourbon and the heritage distilleries. But uh, at the end of the day, they're getting sugar from corn. They're getting, um, you know, conversion for the fermentation from malt and a little bit of flavoring from rye and, and everything else is coming from the barrel. <clears throat> So it's interesting to see how if you highlight some of these uh, grains and use different grains and higher quality grains, it, it really shines through. So, Jordan, why don't you, uh, you know, lead us off here? No pressure. Yeah. What would you think so, about Barrel no. C? So it's funny. So so Barrel C was actually the first one I tasted. And I thought to myself, this is really good, right? Because it had some of those, some of the same characteristics as two, but they were or Barrel B, but they were a little bit more muted. I think the finish is a little bit longer. So still some of those dessert baking spices that were in B, um, slightly more muted. The finish is a little bit longer. But then I tried barrel B right afterwards. And I was like, huh, that's everything I like to barrel C just ramped up to like an 11. Um, <laughs> just on steroids. Yeah. So yeah, really, I mean, it really is. So like barrel, if, if barrel B wasn't in this sample mix, I would have said C is fantastic. And, you know, a standalone, if you gave this to me anywhere else, I'd say this is fantastic, right? Because it contains a lot of those same notes um that i see in b just slightly more muted and then you hit b and it just ramps them up um so c you know same thoughts i had on on c as i had on b dessert profile longer finish sweeter right compared to that that spice pop in a but um it's good but if i'm comparing them between the three it still leads me back to b but but c is still you know my my order of preference is definitely bca it's um it's really good. It highlights that uniqueness that I think a lot of folks are looking for if they're used to just drinking normal bourbon and they're looking to expand their whiskey profile and palate. Um, this is this is good. It's just not quite up to the level of B, but this is really good. Jay, what'd you think on this one? Sample C. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of <clears throat> sorry. Um I definitely agree. I, I like this. It reminds me a lot of B. It also really reminds me of the Knob Creek flavor profile. Um, a lot of peanuts, a lot of kind of that nougaty dessert note as well. But um, this, this this one is significantly hotter, in my opinion, than B for being about the same fruit. And I don't know if that's, you know, results into how toasting is playing with the maturation here. But yeah, it's pretty much like a hot B. So, you know, I think if B wasn't in here, this would be great because I, you know, I wouldn't have like a, a cooler version of it to compare to. And, and I like all the notes here, especially like that waffle cone just keeps coming out. And if that's like a characteristic of your malt, like, like I'm in, like, you know, I like, <laughs> I like waffle cones. So, you know, that's a good start. And that's, that's one of the reasons I like Knob Creek so much as I do is every time I have it, I'm like, oh, you know, waffle cone. So the fact that I'm pulling that here makes me really happy. I, I really like this. A was super fruity. C is way more tannic which i think is you know maybe b is playing that you know blend of, of aging and the toasting is kind of bringing out but this is a little dry a little tannic a little hot but uh but certainly very good especially for, for years and you know cracking up on 120 proof so that uh yeah very desserty which i'm a fan of you know i'm, I'm a mm -hmm. on the way to fat guy myself in quarantine here so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but i like it you know. yeah Nick, what'd you think about this one? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm gonna kind of jump in there with everybody else. I think I'm I'm sharing a lot of the same sentiments. Um, you know, I will say across the board, if if you hadn't told me or if you hadn't given the age, which what's really cool was, and this isn't always something that comes with single barrel samples, is all the details on each of these barrels. Um, you know, from the the barrel date to the exact age down to the day. Um, you know, the toast profile, things like entry proof, things like that. You know, a lot of times you're kind of going back and asking for that information. So I think that's really great to have that information just readily available here um, because you can learn about what's, you know, what you're actually drinking. But, um, you know, again, yeah, I think I'm, I'm on that B number one for sure, then C, then A um, for me. I will say, and so what's interesting, and I had, I had tasted some of these grains as we were chatting here. Um, so last year we visited a local malt house, 1886 malt um, in Fulton, New York, and they actually pretty good, big operation here. Um, I can't remember how many different malts we tried, but we were looking to pick one for uh, a single barrel that we're basically distilling with a local distillery. And, um, you know, so I was just blown away by the variation of flavors that you get 
from these malts and we actually steeped so we went through we tasted a ton of them just tried them and we picked probably like 12 and then steeped them like a tea and went through and said okay let's get it down to three malts and then and then we let our our, our group kind of pick you know which of these three do you want to use as they as the malt for this uh, barrel we're doing and so i was just blown away by the amount of flavor and the variation of flavor from malt and i think it's kind of a an area that hasn't been explored as much as it could be and just an open door for just a, a lot of fantastic flavor profiles that you can bring to bourbon and you know in other whiskeys that bourbon drinkers are going to like you know whatever they might be technically classified at as at the end of the day but um you know i'm i'm, I'm liking this direction towards the malt that you know you guys are taking and even at this young age it's just these are just absolutely fantastic um from here so i'll, I'll give up the floor at this point uh, enough about uh you know my explorations in new york state so uh go ahead, Blake. I that feedback. that's that's really a cool uh story and also just appreciate the, the perspective there we just to add to it though we we do have other recipes in our in our uh, barrel house about 75 80 percent of what we make at our riverfront production distillery is our 91 111 recipe but we've got probably close to a dozen other recipes that are you know their fate is tbd at this point but hopefully in the years to come you guys will get access to some different flavor profiles that to your point nick uh explore some different types of malts mm. some of the recipes that we scaled up from experimental that um you know speak to just a even a slightly different mash bill of some of these uh malts at different percentages or adding five percent of you know a chocolate malt just absolutely changes the whole profile overall so, so kind of to follow up on that with that 91 solera are i mean a, or infinity barrel however you want to think of it is that i mean that's going to basically retain uh, as you change things that's going to retain stuff indefinitely right unless you guys eventually say let's just dump the whole thing and start from scratch yeah so the 91 uh solera just holds one recipe just to clarify but but yeah over time you know um it, we're we're okay with the profile slightly shifting around a little bit Mm -hmm. um, but the Solera does act as as a consistency um, buffer for us in certain ways, no matter what. Because if if we just used our proofing tank size, which is a, holds about ten to twelve barrels, um, the batch to batch variation would be pretty high um, or higher than what we currently have. Whereas right now, with ninety plus barrels, the variation you know over a long period of time if our age starts to climb up to three, four years, yeah, you will see a, a, a slow kind of difference. Um, but the consistency from a, from 90 barrels kind of speaking over time gives us a, a sense of consistency as a craft distiller, that's very important. So, and it also adds an element of esterification in there that, you know, you can't really put your finger on it with the Solera finishing process on what it adds, but we say it's fruity. It adds like a little bit of a peach or citrus kind of amplifier to the profile. But, um, you know, it's got that ageless complexity that we really like. Interesting. And John, I mean, I know you kind of already cast your vote on this one, but uh, Barrel C, what would what, what, you like about it? What'd you think of it? Uh, Do you know how hard it is for me to keep my mouth shut? this whole time i mean i'm doing the best i can i i just you know i you didn't get to back clean up on sample b so i figured i'd give you clean up on this one so no, just, it, yeah, go sample, ahead sample c is still as sexy as that bourbon charity hat that tim pearson's wearing but i would say and everybody go to bourboncharity.org can't help yeah. it but nice little plug in there but uh it's almost like a, a dry white wine on the front and then chocolate on the finish. It's, you know, somebody that I'd probably take out on a date, but I wouldn't take home to mom. B is just, you know, <laughs> B is that one. I really want to go home to mom and just hug and right there with you, all that stuff. Everything about B, I just love it. I'm sorry. 
I've clearly right. been taking down tasting notes wrong all this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's those old factory sensors. Are we picking a barrel? I'm confused. <laughs> yeah. I followed it. Like, COVID has both. made us all go crazy. Um, yeah. But I'm just saying, I man, C is great. There's nothing that I could say that's bad about C. There's nothing. I mean, there are good things about C and A, but it's one of those things for me. I'm I'm a big mouthfeel guy, opposed to other things, and just the the second you take that sip of B, you're like, all right, this is it. I know. When it's good, it's good. Man, right there with you, John. Yeah, and I mean, y- you know, it. Uh, you know, we kind of talked about earlier. We we assume with five people, we'll have some split votes. There'll be some discussion, but man, I think everyone's kind of in agreement on this one. Um, I, I loved B. You know, I loved the. It, it almost is like a s'more to me with with graham cat cracker sweetness some spice charred marshmallow um i do get i don't get a ton of chocolate and maybe not as much as some others but yeah i think it was delicious so do we want to put it to an official vote uh all those in favor of a i see those hands i see no no okay b i hold i'm gonna hold on my samples and and camera here so you can see b a lot yeah yeah so so that anything that sounds like uh you know b it is which is unanimous really exciting i mean it's just it's interesting to see um especially just because we're talking about but between a and b it's the same distillate going into a different barrel um grant uh as far as like aging rack house uh levels um, is there a big variation that you're seeing between those or, uh, you know, overall everything's pretty consistently aged? Everything's fairly consistent. I think our, you know, you get a few degrees difference from the, the bottom of our warehouse to the top, but we, uh, we only go, uh, three or four high and, um, you know, there's a limitation to how much difference you get in there. What I kind of equate our warehouse to is a, um, a more a, like a heated dunnage, if you will, like a, you know, in Scotland, you've got usually in a cellar with brick walls. And in, in our distillery, we also have brick walls. So it holds on to a lot of heat. So our, our uh, climate is pretty interesting. The, the temperature swings aren't as drastic, but um, they kind of, you know, uh, as you, you know, start to get into the summertime, it takes a couple extra weeks for the whole building to heat up because you've got a the thermal mass of all the barrels together but also all that those thick brick walls that are holding on to a lot of that um or waiting to kind of come to equilibrium with the outside so overall generally speaking we have some hot spots in that room some some are closer to the back door but it's not not too big of a difference not nearly as much of a difference as as you've seen with the barrel profiling and charring it's also it's also a black building with a black roof. Uh, yeah, this in, in the middle of you know uh, of southeast Tennessee, so it, it, gets, it gets pretty damn hot in there. It's so certainly not a super Einstein. dealership, though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I ask you guys, Tim and Grant. I see you guys uh, sipping a little bit. I wasn't sure. Are you drinking the same barrels we're drinking? Something else? What's what's in your glasses over there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> doing work. Yeah, so, so I do. So I have a question for Tim and Grant. You know, I think yeah. the groups the groups settled on Barrel B, so that's what we're probably going to go with. But just curious, of the three, and I realize it's picking your favorite child of your children, right? But when you tasted these samples, what one stuck out to you? And this is going to be like a personal palate, you know, preference. Well, I you know um, that is tough. I sent you guys a, a note on that. I, I do feel that way at certain points. The sample C was actually one that I kind of went into the, the barrel house and knew we were going to be doing this. And we, I was trying to find a sample that might speak um, in a little bit different way, even though it was a number four. It had some top notes in there that I think you guys really pinpointed and appreciated. But sample, sample C really stood out to me as having um, the, the spirit um, quality, that high malt spirit essence that I really like that, you know, underlying toastiness, richness, just from the spirit. And then the barrel kind of added to it. So from the standpoint of like classic meats are high malt, I really thought that was a good example. Um, 
two, we liked it because it, it showcased, you know, Nick, you pointed out, it's very expressive in terms of its fruit character and those top notes. I thought um, that sandwiching um, B right in between there, if you guys have ever seen The Fighter, um, we, uh, Tiana, who's, who put this set together, we were talking about the order of how we would, we would put them A, B, C, and the uh, Mark Wahlberg's character, he's talking to his future, future wife, and he talks to her about uh, boxing. And he says, you know, you go head body, head body. And he's like, what, what's head body, head body? And he's, he's talking about throwing the fighter off balance, you know, head, and then they protect themselves up top, and then you hit him in the body, and then they bring it down. And it's that's kind of how we – decided to go about this was give you guys a you know something the head that was, body you know, yeah. <laughs> the body and then back to the head again and i think the tasting really showcased that but one thing i would say if you do have sample left over bringing the two bring two two of them together including b either sample a and b or sample c and b i think would be a really great way to showcase what um 91 and 111 are all about from a balanced perspective of that toast profile, uh, really highlighting the spirit as well, and um, what what they offer. Uh, collectively. Yeah, I, for me, guys, it was uh, it was B. I mean, I was um, I would say B was my favorite, uh, C was my second favorite, uh, and A was third. Um, it, and you know, we're doing tastings uh, every time. There's a Solera barrel fill every time. There's a uh, a, a, a you know batch 111 that goes into the bottling run uh, the distillers they pull they pull all the barrels out and they do they have a they have basically a quality control check which is my favorite day of the, uh, yeah. of the week and so i go back there and basically we get to taste single barrels right before they're batched so these barrels are generally 50 percent, or generally they're always 50 percent of them are a four char and 50% of them are a three char with our, uh, with our own toast profile. And, um, so now for, you know, three years, I've gone back there and just about every week, you know, gotten to watch the development of our, our flagship 91 recipe, um, as well as some other recipes outside of 91, but I've gotten to see these things develop in four chars and three chars with a toast. And I've been able to compare them for a very long time. Historically for me, you know, the, I, so uh, the four char has been a more classic profile for me. And uh, the three char with the toast has been a more confectionary uh, profile for me. And I've always leaned to, I love, I love the beauty that we bring them together because I think that, you know, marrying classic and confectionery and this that's what makes it more rich and more complex but when you guys i mean john when you were going on and on about all the uh, desserts that you love you know honestly like that that is what i love about b as well and that's what i love about tennessee high malt is that it is a it is a s'more it is a waffle cone it is like honey drizzled french toast you know it has a very french toast mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh aroma and, and taste to it and um and it is that it's for me it's like before we made tennessee high malt you know i always i had a handful of classic bourbons that i kept on me at all times and i, I like half the time i drink it with one or two uh maybe even three cubes in half the time I drink it neat. But when I'm drinking classic bourbon neat or, and I throw one or two cubes on it, for me, it's it, it, historically uh, after a period of time, it opens up so much that it gets really sweet and it really brings the corn and the rye out of it. And it just gets, it's the corn and the rye become a little overpowering for me again on ice. On ice, they become a little overpowering for me, and it gets really, really sweet. What I love about Chattanooga Whiskey's Tennessee High Malt recipes is that when I put them, put it on ice, if I put it on one or two cubes or a big cube or whatever, it doesn't ever, because of that richness, it, it there's never really an overpowering sweetness to it. 
And uh, and it really is that depth and that those those kind of roasty, toasty, uh, like rich biscuity flavors that you get out of it that I feel like it 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 serves neat or on ice really really well. And I think B is in this setup. B is my favorite because it represents what I love about our about our whiskey. I love that you said all that almost as much as I love that Grant brought up the pride of Lowell, Massachusetts, Mickey Ward. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm from Andover, Massachusetts. Oh, really? Merrimack Valley represent Mickey oh, Ward. Yeah. Grant, I'll, I'll say calf for you if you want me to sound like you're still at <laughs> Sam Adams. <laughs> I've also never been hungrier after a barrel tasting. I don't know what it is, but like all these like waffles and, you know, waffle cones and French toast being thrown out. I've, I've never been hungrier. <laughs> so well, tonight is one of those dessert better. before dinner nights, right? Yeah. yeah, this, yeah. This, this, uh, we ate our cookies. We, so they're, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Polish those off real quick. But I have two no. real quick questions if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, sorry. jump on in. Hey, no, nope. first off, so I'm drinking your new make here now, um, which is totally French toast. Um, and I've been, oh, cool. been like, oh, French toast. You know, uh, what proof is this at? Because, you know, dinner's coming up and I should probably be able to stand up for it. But <laughs> that's at one fifteen entry proof. Yeah. OK, that's what I figured. Um, it tastes it tastes really good. You know, um, I can see why we're getting so much dessert in the barrels because, you know, there's already dessert here, you know. Yep. Um, my second question, so, so you guys have mentioned that you have quite a few things going on, especially with different malts and different experiments and stuff. So, like, uh, what's the craziest thing in the Chattanooga Skunk Works you guys can talk about? Like, what's the craziest shit you guys got <laughs> hanging out? Oh, we, I mean, we've done some weird <laughs> stuff. We did a lot of weird stuff early on just because we were like, fuck it. We don't, we don't, what's the, <laughs> we got this experimental distillery. We, don't you have like explosivo barrels or some other tenacious D <laughs> reference? Or, yeah. We distilled on um, on uh, nuts. We so on a on basically after our wash run, we got some chestnuts and hazelnut flowers and distilled on those to get the essence of those that nutty characteristic. That was pretty weird. We've done firm. We've done co fermentations. So like you know brandy like but still with with grains in them so malts and corn um we've done some some weird stuff in there a lot of it hasn't been released because we're just trying to kind of figure out exactly when it's when it's at its peak and where, how to best express it but a lot of a lot of these experiments, a lot of these experimental trials are um, are in a way like not to sound pretentious, but a little bit like performance art, we kind of just take what we have available and we cobble together a concept. And the concept might last until the release of it, like four, three, four, five, six years later, but it might not. It might actually evolve as we taste the whiskey. And in some cases we've had, you know, a concept that we thought was going to be on a certain track with a certain finish. And we decided, you know what, let's finish it in this instead because we're getting a certain characteristic out of it. And that's where the our, one of our most recent experimental rum finishes came from was we just noticed that, I got a lot of comments from our from fellow distillers that, man, some of these barrels just taste like rum to me. And uh, hmm. said, okay, well, let's, in, let's amplify that character. So we got a couple different types of rum barrels in and kind of did a dual finish on those and it really we thought expressed that character a lot more elegantly and interestingly than than what its original intention for those barrels was it's also so. pretty amazing i'll just say this you know with our two systems i would love to uh, host you guys in chattanooga when you know when we all get more comfortable um but uh it's pretty amazing that the difference between uh, or just the nuances from a hundred gallon pot still system versus our uh, our copper column and pot uh, finish system, um, we have a, a very uh, particular like character that no almost to this point. So we've done over three hundred experimental barrels now at the Chattanooga Whiskey Experimental Distillery, and we've done nearly thirty releases since uh, August of twenty seventeen. And I mean, even Blake, even that that uh, Tennessee high malt gin, barrel aged gin, you know, that you've sold like all no, which was obviously way off the beaten path for us. 
but even with all that, with whether it's a whether, whether it's a high malt barrel aged gin or whether it's something a little a little closer to our flagship or whatever it is, there is a unique character that is shared in every batch that comes off of that hundred gallon pot still that we couldn't possibly. It has like a it has a funk that we all really like, and it and it's and you actually it's a it, you we could not replicate it at Riverfront. And, uh, and we were actually pleasantly surprised and happy with the character that came off of the Riverfront system because it creates a very consistent, clean profile that I think is more enjoyable to the average consumer. But, but, but the stuff that comes out of Experimental just across the board has this particular character that you just can't create uh, off, of a, off of a you know column pot system. Man, if you guys do like an open air ferment American rum, you just give me a call or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> real funky. Yeah, yeah. gnarly yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, we're, and we're, yeah, we're always, our, I'm really fortunate to have a group of six distillers that I work with who are bringing ideas like that every single day. And it is really a kind of a, a consensus and creativity building exercise every single day that. I come to work and uh, we got a couple folks who primarily focus on R and D and I'm kind of there to, you know, guide the ship, if you will, and, and n navigate the concept. But we're, we're really fortunate to have just a lot of uh, creative, really cool uh, ideas in the hopper every single day. We've got, I, I'm, I'm convinced we have the best uh, group of distillers in the business. I'm not, sugarcoating that at all yeah and i gotta tell you like this new make so those of you that don't realize there was a little sample of new make in the you know the single barrel sample box mm -hmm. that came so i gotta tell you so at least one so one very prominent um uh, bourbon company out there that talked about sourcing with me um you know privately and that talked about the distillation, the, you know, what's coming off the still for where they're sourcing from and so on and so forth. If it's not good, it doesn't matter if you age it a year, two years, four years, six years, eight years, it doesn't matter. It's never going to be good. This new make is absolutely fantastic. It is. That, Thank you. I mean, it, I, I'm, and I'm not saying that because we're on this, because I'm going to say if, I, if that was the case, I just wouldn't say anything. <laughs> I would just get my mouth shut. I mean, really, truly, the new make is fantastic and that's what you know you start with the good you know distillate and then it goes from there and the barrel enhances it so if you have bad distillate you know the yes the barrel will make it better but you have that much higher of a hill to climb it's that much steeper you know so you've got those flavors coming right from here and uh i think that's really great that you guys include this and i would say keep doing that include it with the single barrel barrel sample because people able to see, you know, this is how it started. And then this is what the barrel did to it. That kind of like progression of point A to point B is a really interesting, you know, scenario for people that are selecting a single barrel because you can see where some of these flavors are coming through and you can kind of compare this to then going back to the, after it's been aged in the barrel, but then you can also say, okay, well, what did the barrel do to it? So that's again, not typically something you get as a, you know, here's my comparison from here. What did the, what did the distillate bring to the table? What did the barrel bring to the table? Whereas I think that's a it's a great idea to include. And I'd say if if you know keep doing it. And if you're watching this and you're, you're a company and you're not doing it, start doing it because it's it's a great idea. Yeah, hey, I just gotta jump in. I, I love you guys. Uh, I gotta go be a dad. I've taken too much time away and <laughs> both my wife and I are trying to work from home. So uh, sorry, I got up. <laughs> love you both. Uh, love you guys. Thank you for letting me sub in as Kenny for this. And uh, <laughs> go ahead and find us at Dad's Drinking Bourbon and go drink some of this Chattanooga whiskey. I assume we picked B, right? <laughs> we, we, we actually yeah, switched it while you were away. It was B with an apostrophe, though. though yeah, just but, just right. to be clear. <laughs> well, I'm going to go so I don't get divorced. And uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.
No, this was really fun. Thanks guys for having us. And thanks yeah, for doing yeah. the barrel pick. It was, um, I think yeah. that you came, everything was top notch. I think the barrel that we chose is for those at home who get a bottle are going to be blown away. I mean, truly, yeah. truly saying that, right? Sometimes you do barrel picks and it's like, oh, okay, this is good. This was truly great. And I do look forward to sharing this with other bourbon drinkers who aren't exposed to American malt whiskey. I think they're going to be super impressed. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so Thanks. much. Jordan. Yeah. Appreciate that, man. Nice work on whoever suggested that fancy ass box too. <laughs> I thought I was getting like a red writer VP gun. We got, and we got the best creative director. He was actually our first employee uh, like uh, eight years ago. So uh, he's he's unbelievable. He's one of our very close friends, and um, and he is uh, he's a critical part of Chattanooga whiskey. A hundred percent of the packaging, all that he does. He, every anything you see visually, he did it. So I might not be able yeah. to throw that thing away. I know. I, I have to say that was the best sample kit I've ever received. For those who are watching, oh, yeah. um, it, it oh, came yeah. with you know the white dog, uh, Tennessee water. Although Jordan lost his water, so he he had to substitute some process. PA that's water. Okay. I but use then, PA water. But that's yeah. okay. And I kid you There's not, like, when he messaged, malts. my water broke. I was like, "Is he looking <laughs> pregnant? What is going on here?" But it, it occurred to me. I'm like, "Oh, hold okay. on a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, this has been great. So if you're just jumping in, we chose Barrel B. Um, it will be available on Sealbox. Uh, everybody who's been a part of this selecting team, you, you know, the, their groups will will uh, send out emails, and so that way everybody knows. And yeah, this barrel will go fast. Um, but you know, you know, not to put Tim and Grain on any pressure, but hopefully there's more barrels to come out of Chattanooga single barrels. And uh, but um, no, thank you everyone for watching and. Yeah, just if, if everyone was to kind of go around the horn one last second um, and just say who you are, where, where people can find you, and um, yeah, we'll do that. So, Nick, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm Nick from uh, Breaking Bourbon, breakingbourbon.com. Check us out on uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all at Breaking Bourbon. And uh, yeah, thanks for having us, guys. This was a lot of fun. It's great to be the first. And like Blake said, I, I think this is like the first. And then we're going to have the second and the third. We're going to keep going. <laughs> right? So we're going to line this up for, for indefinitely. But uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. So uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second that. So this is Jordan from Breaking Bourbon. Make sure you check out BreakingBourbon.com for all of our latest reviews and our release calendar. And especially if you sign up for a single barrel club. And Tim Grant, we're super looking forward to meeting you guys in person. We can finally start traveling down to Tennessee. And um, this was good. Like I said, I'm super excited to bring just American malted and specifically Tennessee malted whiskey down to our um, – our normal bourbon drinking fans who may not have a chance to experience this in the past. So I think they're going to be blown away. Cool. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Yeah. Jay. Thanks for your time guys. Um, so I'm, I'm Jay from take that review for those of you that, that don't know how to spell it because it is weird. Um, it's T eight K E dot review. Uh, that's my website. You can find me on Instagram. I'm talking about shit all the time. Um, thanks for your time guys. This was a blast. I've been trying to try chat for some time, but you know, I, I live in Wisconsin now we can't travel. It's kind of hard to get to you. So, uh, let me, let me know when you guys are open again. Uh, I got family in Tennessee, so I'll stop on by. But uh, yeah, this has been a blast. If, if you like reading my stuff, feel free to follow me online. And uh, you know, this this was super fun. I think you guys are doing great, great stuff. And uh, I appreciate you both taking time out of your what appears to be a sunny day. It's raining here, so you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure you guys could be out walking a dog or something. But uh, I appreciate you guys talking to us. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so Tim and Grant, uh, Chattanooga whiskey. Uh, it's it's really fun to be able to connect with you guys on here. Even if uh, we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, it would still be fun to connect with you guys on here. But, uh, but we would definitely love for you to come down and see our operation. We, we definitely think we have a world-class operation that is very unique to the industry. Um, we are very excited that uh, we do have something that we can call the only Tennessee high malt. And, um, and we can't think of a better group of people to share this first barrel with. Um, you know, Grant and I are, are uh, excited at the barrel that you chose. Um, and if anybody wants to get in touch with us, we're, we're very easily accessible. Uh, so you can just go to in, just email us at info at chatternewwhiskey.com. I, I see those emails every day. Um, you know, check us out on all of our social media pages. Uh, you know, uh, follow us. I think we're, we're uh, predominantly active on Instagram. So go to uh, Instagram chat whiskey that's chat with two t's and uh 
and we're we're super excited about this. And obviously, um, we've 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 got a lot to tell the world. There's just only so much time we can uh, we can you know tell it in. So thank you guys, appreciate it. Sounds good. All right, thanks everyone for watching. And um, yeah, that that was a great tasting. So thanks for joining us. Have a thanks. good night. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks all.